great pleasure to welcome Marina Warner, our next uh, speaker. And actually, Marina also uh, does not need, for sure, an introduction here. But what I wanted to say before we actually start is um, that we will show some uh, visuals before the talk. And I think it will be a few minutes, and then we start. OK. Very okay. Very good. No, I, just, I just thought that as you'd raised a, um, a pavilion in the park, um, it seemed a way into the question of illusion, which I think lies so much behind the question of belief. Um, I thought somehow your bubble, which floats um, and is a temporary structure and is, re and is gathering us together in a temporary space for a sp certain amount of fluid time, that um, it connected to one of the most remarkable mirages that occur in nature, which is Fata Morgana. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just thought I'd show you one or two pictures of Fata Morgana. And I think actually in some ways even your freeze inside, though I think it's leaves, has some, something to bear on it because it seems a refraction and a series of reflections, which is what Fata Morgana is. Um, this, which you probably can't see on the plasma screens, is a very rare 18th century print showing the effect in the Straits of Messina. Um, you won't be able to see it, so we'll go to the next one. But what happens is that bands of different temperature air um, change, create mirrors in the sky and, and these reflect in the water and reflect on the clouds. This is an actual photograph of Fata Morgana occurring in the Arctic Circle. It's either very hot temperatures or very low temperatures that cause these mirrors in the air. If we then have the next one, you'll see a close-up. Now that is something that's enormously high, that's towering into the sky uh, as high as what you can ever imagine as high. And um, it's known as to the Norsemen in myth as a Hillingar. And they thought that they were castles raised by the gods. Um, the next one. Now, this is the point I'm making. Those are just meteorological phenomena. They're just wonders. But in the Christian tradition, these wonders in the sky were interpreted as portents. And they became, you can see here the relationship between these bands of clouds that are stretching across and the phenomena of reflections. This is a very characteristic one of a battle occurring in the sky, lots of horsemen, lots of armies fighting, and some image, a sort of Christian Christ image at the top. And if we have the next one, um, this bloody heads in the clouds and a, and a drawn sword. Again, a Fata Morgana mirage, but particularly interpreted by a collective group, this is important at this point, by a crowd, seen as a sign from the heavens that something terrible is going to happen. Sometimes a victory is going to happen too. Next one. And there's heavenly ships, a very common one, because actually that's a very common reflection that occurs, that the ships actually floating on the sea, their image is reflected up on the clouds. Now, the next one is a leap. Um, the, this one is just a tiny stone. This is an agate. And it belonged to somebody, you were asking people who inspired them. It belonged to Roger Caillois, who's an interesting a writer I'm interested in. And it's just a split through an agate, but almost everyone in this room will see a face in that and also a particular kind of face, a sort of phantasmagoric face, some sort of cat ghost type. And the stone is known, it's only about this size, the stone is known as Petit Fantôme, little ghost. Now the point about that in terms of belief and illusion is that the brain finds it extremely hard to resist the illusion. It is very hard to see that as a stone, unless you're told to. And so in some ways, I kind of wanted to draw attention to that, that we are much more drawn by the structures of our brain that make us perceive certain things. And the, the wider circles around that are the ideologies and belief systems that make us, that, that shape our perceptions. And I think that this kind of um, situation is one that we very much live in today. That's it. Many thanks. Actually, it leads directly to our first question because we were wondering uh, about the relation between the city and phantoms or yeah. ghosts because uh, uh, of what you're just about to show us, but also because of somehow bringing that back to our event here about London and the city. So it would be great if you could tell us about city and ghosts. <laughs> um, well, as you know, it's become a tremendously strong um, element in a lot of writing about London. And I think it belongs to a kind of new secular metaphysics of some of the people who are resisting religious metaphysics. And it's also to do with um, trying to tell stories about the past that will perhaps awaken certain ghosts who might actually help. Now sometimes these can be, so two things are happening. One is that the kind of hauntings that 
people excavate. And if you like, a writer like Sebald will do that, though he didn't specialize in cities. Um, Ian Sinclair, who is you know, someone who might easily have been here, but he, he was wasn't. here at uh, yes. 6 a.m., yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, Ian Sinclair is the great master of the London, the London walk, the London walker, the dériveur, the person who goes drifting through the city and, ex and sort of hears the voices of the past. And I think that this, I, there are sort of two things that I'm particularly interested in. One is that memory can be constructive. Um, it can be constructive because it can be critical, so that you don't actually just inherit your memories, but you question them, you interrogate them, you uncover them. I mean, this is obvi an obvious process of any writer. But at the same time, that I think this is, a, this is a sort of sense a newer point, and that is that a lot of writers uh, in all media and a lot of artists are also engaged in trying to tell a new story. So they're trying to take that part, that story from the past, and say, is there anything we can do with this? Now, it's not quite fairy tale, though fairy tale is something I'm very interested in because it's wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. But this kind of wishful thinking and sort of mythological perspective um, construction of the past, some people attack it, people who are atavistic, people who want to go back to some earth project, some earth text that is the fundamentalists, will always dislike the perspective imagination at work. They will dislike the idea that you can look at a given data and what you interpret from it will always be phantasmagoric to some extent because that is how our minds work. We work with images and we work with symbols and that's how we are. So I think that one, a lot of interesting people, writers, are trying to take that and to some extent mix in a new, a new story. And some of the people I heard even this afternoon were saying that. I mean, Hussein Shalayan was saying it about you know, his his approach as a dress designer. I mean, that's as a couturier. So it's, it's, it spreads through different, I mean, I happen to know more about writing, but. I wanted to actually ask you about another link uh, to the city uh, related also to immigration. In your book, Let to Bundle, you actually write about um, immigrants uh, in the city. Uh, and I was somehow wondering on um, actually kind of the, your sort of opinion of you on the government's current uh, legislation on immigration here. Well, uh, there's yet another, I mean, the, it, it sort of every week brings another deplor, deplorable um, step that this government takes. Um, I, I, am, I mean, I, I don't want to go into the sort of details of the immigration laws, but of course it's a tre tremendous, the, 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 the way, it's, it's also an unholy relationship with the media. I mean, we do really have a very problematic representation of immigration and um, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, in our mass media, so there's some attempts to, to counteract that. Um, in the later bundle, I actually uh, wanted to show that exclusion is a dynamic of society at any time. But what, the only thing that you can take from that, 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 the only thing that you can, the only grain of hope that you can take from that is that it operates along different lines at different times, so it is in metamorphosis itself. One of the sort of racist bases of our present immigration policies is that it tends to define people in a certain way, according race, racial and national boundaries, um, ethnic uh, divisions and so forth. And that, that is just, it is a temporal thing. It has happened in history at a certain time. It only started happening recently, and we can reverse it. Now, how we deal with the larger problem that exclusion is this kind of human thing, the, the drawing of borders, the drawing of boundaries, the pure, the impure, the, 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 the permitted ritual, the non-permitted ritual, the, the, you know, what is forbidden, what is not forbidden. Um, where, the, where, we, where we draw these divisions, I mean, it is our responsibility to attempt to draw them in an inclusive fashion. I mean, that's such a banal thing to say because how do we start doing it? But, but some people, you know, are trying. I wanted to ask you more about London because you have been connected to London for such a long time. And I was wondering how London changed and how you think it will change in the next decades. Well, the main thing that I've experienced as a change is property. Um, pro London has become too expensive for many of its people to live in. Um, and um, the mixed housing, which was a characteristic of London since the war, in which streets were mixed up with all kinds of different uh, types of, types of co accommodation and housing, that is all being changed along much more, you know much more about it than I do, of course, being an architect. But, um, but the... Um, and, but, but, but basically, it, this is happening, in, it is moving towards an American-style, property-banded city. And that is catastrophic for the social cohesion of, of, of our communities. Um, we need to have layered and banded and different 
people living side by side. How we resist it is, is beyond, of course, again, I mean, how we resist the, proper, the march of the property market in an, in an era of free market forces is really very difficult. Your presentation is very uh, precise uh, and also very urgent. Um, and it seems to have the urgency of somebody who uh, is trying to avert a disaster. Uh, <laughs> uh, which disaster are you trying to avert by insisting on this ghostly dimension? Well, I've come increasingly... Oh, and, yeah. and, and what, uh, what are we to gain by recognizing it? Well, I mean, in response to Hans Ulrich's question about how London has changed, of course, one of the greatest changes, it's not a material change, but one, of the, one that I had not expected was the change to religious belief. I mean, this was really, you know, I wrote a book in the 1970s about the Virgin Mary, which ends with a prophecy that no one will believe in the Virgin Mary by the end of the millennium. Well, I could not have been more wrong. <laughs> so, so, I mean, far from the, the you know, belief declining, it is actually gaining pace. So my, um, my, this apocalyptic note that you have quite rightly yeah. identified um, is in some sense a kind of echo yeah. of an apocalyptic discourse which I have been feeling for quite a long time. We all feel it. It is present in our politics. Um, but I think that there's been a growth of um, collusion between entertainment and political discourse. Um, not only in the direct representation of religious wars in films, um, which, and, and they, they are religious wars. I mean, even if they're fantasy wars, they are religious wars. But also in the spread of, and, and this is why to some extent I'm very interested in your kind of work, and your, particularly your kind of work with textures and so forth, the, the spread of a disengagement with embodiment. Um, and so I, the, some of the apocalyptic um, yeah. elements in my work are that I feel people are no longer, um, they are haunted themselves with increasing numbers of specters. Now these can take the form of celebrities. I mean, it, we are the first generation who know not only what we looked like when we were children, because we have seen so many photographs of ourselves. Our children know what they, what they looked like moving, moving, which we don't, our generation don't know. They, they know themselves when they're moving, so they know themselves in these spectral forms, but they're disembodied. And of course, we also know many, many, many other, many you know, famous people, many political figures as, as specters who haunt us. So I, and I think this disengages us with the reality of bodies. And one of the problems with the wars that are going on with the invasion of Lebanon and, 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 um, and on many other fronts, and people scream blue murder that people are being killed, that's because they've forgotten that's what happens in a war. And that's what happens to bodies in a war. But they scream because they want it to be a movie. They want it to be spectral. Many thanks, Marina Bono, many thanks.